Oh, hey, it's you. Welcome back to the Black Bill. Uh, here goes another bit that's kind of old. It's like, it's nine years old. Uh, but I still, man, I still feel all this stuff. We're talking about cheering up. Uh, have you ever been, like, sad or properly depressed and someone just goes, just cheer up? It was about that. Um, here we go. I'm a worried man. I mostly worry about things far outside my own control. Climate change, racism, wealth inequality, the ongoing dismantling of our democracy. People get the impression that I'm an unhappy person. They try to cheer me up. Make a list of positive things in your life, they say, or listen to happy music or hug your kid, you know? And uh, I'm beyond pretending I'm not reading off a script, okay? I'm just past that. This is what's happening. Okay. Um, really, though, I'm fairly content being discontent. Happy moments come along unplanned but recognized. The best of these, though, are gripped through with melancholy. My son's birthday party is cause for celebration. What a wonderful, open, caring young man he is, full of empathy and empty of worldliness. Uh, at age nine, he's fairly worldly now, I guess. Joy cannot happen for me, though, without the melancholy. He will never again have a ninth birthday. He'll never again have an 18th birthday. Soon, the child of this moment will be replaced by the man of the next moment. All I can do for him is try to teach him gentleness before he gets too big to learn the lesson. A perfect day of fishing is marked by the impermanence of natural beauty all around me. By the taking of the fish, the lake's silver treasure, so strong and vital and alive. It is, for me at least, the knowledge of the impermanence of joy, beauty, happiness that makes these feelings worth being. The one does not annihilate the other. Sadness and joy are both emanations from the same emotional object. The more you can let yourself experience sadness, the more room you carve out in yourself for joy. Happy and sad are not opposite experiences. We weep with relief. We weep for joy. We weep for the experience of beauty. You probably cry at weddings, but you still go to them. You probably cried at the end of Old Yeller, but you've still seen it 90 times. You need those tears. Seek them out. If you are a man from the U.S., maybe you don't show them in public, but you still need them and feel them. Music tells us the same story. There's happy music for people who want to tap their feet and shake their tail feathers. I enjoy such music. Twist and Shout, uh, The Beatles, Thriller, Jackson, uh, Ladies' Night, Cool and the Gang. But I don't generally prefer that music. When seeking out music, I prefer songs that express rather than contradict my dysphoria. Painted black, the Rolling Stones. Black, Pearl Jam. It's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday. Boys to men, American Pie, Don McLean. As Waters notes in his 2010 book, Crazy Like Us, Sadness for some people is a spiritual experience. The American preoccupation with feeling good, with happiness, comfort, and convenience tends to spoil this experience for others by importing diagnosis and treatment for sadness. I am therefore defensive when others try, with good intentions, to redirect me toward good cheer and comfort. I don't have much of a spiritual life to begin with. This space I've carved out for sadness without depression, for futility without despair, for care without attachment, has been very costly. The costs have been exactly depression, despair, and isolation or even alienation. But this is where I worship 
without knowledge of a God. It's not important to me to feel good. I don't mind when it happens, but I do not seek out the experience. And I love the people who see the sadness, the worry, and have empathy for it. The first response to someone in pain is naturally to try to ease their pain and fix their problems. But I'm not in pain. I don't have a lot of real problems. I would suffer more from happiness than sadness, as happiness would require walking away from this temple in my heart that I built from empathy and agape. I am simply awake in a world that is not only unkind and unjust, but naturally blind to such concepts. These are mere human constructs, and with or without this knowledge, still we must strive for kindness and justice. Thank you for your kindness. I hear it. I wish to reflect it. Today, nine years ago, while I'm writing this piece, I learn of the last writings of Ray Jasper. In two weeks from the time of this writing, he's going to be murdered by the state of Texas. He was executed, it turns out, March 19, 2014. Whether he's a good man or a bad one, I don't know. I'm, I'm more sure that his murder, his execution, will not be justice. He's just one of many black men in our country pushed into our legal punishment system and treated differently because of the color of his skin. Despite being 14% of the population, black men constituted at the time 34% of executions since 1976. Current death row inmates in Texas, 39% black. Nationwide people of color are overwhelmingly more likely to be suspected, stop and frisk and so on, searched, arrested, targeted by neighborhood to resemble a suspect, informed on, plea bargained into the system even when innocent, loaded with unprovable charges to secure the plea agreement, found guilty at trial, and sentenced to longer and harder time than white people. This data mostly comes from uh, Michelle Alexander's 2009 book, uh, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in an age, age Era, Age of Colorblindness. Okay, I spend most of my allotted worrying time on climate change and the interlocking, uh, the interlocking political and policy problems that make it so difficult to fight. Uh, the great existential threat to us all. But maybe I should worry more about racism and mass incarceration. Because if we can't get this right, if we let Ray Jasper go quietly, sell his life for cheap, then maybe we deserve to be erased from the world. Now, if I were to leave my keyboard and go do something to negate, bury, temporize, or annihilate the intense feelings of sadness, angst, anger, that I feel thinking through these issues, that would require slamming that door on my inner temple of walking away from the only worship of which I'm really capable. If I were a person who could do that, I would be a man I would not like so well. And like an unused piercing in a child's earlobe, perhaps that inner space would start to heal over, to close up. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I cannot quite convey the meaning of my attachment to care, sadness, and angst, but I think people understand nonetheless, because I'm not the only person out there listening to typo negative, tool, nirvana, iced tea, pearl jam, the thousand, oh god, the Bronski beat, man. A friend just reintroduced me to the Bronski beat. Jesus Christ, mm. delicious suffering. Or the thousand other musical artists and other artists who cater to our needs for dysphoric expression. I know many others try to live with these feelings and fail. Suicide, drugs, alcohol, 
death by reckless behavior, parasuicide. All this can result in my own family. There are many examples of such problems of living. And in the wider world, many more. How many of our greatest artists have died by their own hands? But I cannot, will not, turn away from this sadness of spirit. If I have anything to contribute to this world, it comes from this place. And just as the joy of fishing is made rather than marred by the brushes with impermanence, so my journey is important to me, both because of the thin surface on which I choose to walk, but also because of the potential fall to either side. Thanks for your kind attention. Black Pill out.